Alright then. We ready? Yeah. Yerp. Yerp. It's episode 69, guys. Hey yo. <laughs> Am I hosting? No. Oh, well then what are we waiting for? Well, yeah, I, didn't, well, like, what are... I didn't know we were ready. Yeah, yeah. we waiting on you, sister. Oh, okay. Sister? It's sister. Alright. I'm I'm too white to say sister. Richard did not kick my ass. There's a real big gap between getting your ass kicked and having a dancing, singing sprite fool you with trickery and then strike you in the throat before you even know you're in a fight. Welcome in to the Bro Four Squad podcast. This is episode 69, giggity, and we are just a bunch of bros drinking beer and talking movies. I'm your host, Jeff Hornacek. Thank you guys so much for checking us out. A lot of fun movie discussion in store today. Before we get to all that, of course, we have to go around and meet the fellow bros with me. And we go first into the lab to the mad scientist, Brian Banner. Brian, how do I know when I need to replace my lawnmower? It's been making some weird sounds lately. It's a great question. I'm actually a lawnmowerologist, so I'm very equipped to handle this question. What exactly is the noise? Can you replicate it for me? It's like a... You're fine. Just put whiskey in the gas tank, pull that motherfucker three times. If it doesn't start, just pay Juan down the street. You'll be fine. The problem is I've already been doing all those things. Then you need to find a new Juan. Okay. There can only be Juan, though. All right. And, of course, no pod could be complete. That, that was so not funny. I have no Nobody segue. laughed. He was trying I, to hold for us to laugh. Honestly, who is supposed to laugh? It's just us three, and we don't think each other's funny anyway. Maybe someone listening at home laughed or driving to work. It's like one of the <laughs> most awkwardest silences we've ever had. We can edit that out, we definitely. And then we'll have to edit out the subsequent discussion right here where we talk about the awkward silence. But next we go to our enforcer in the paint, Matt Geiger. Geiger, do you want to help me kick my ex-wife's new boyfriend's ass? I think it could be a great team-building exercise for us. Who, Eric? You... Dude, Eric's a cool fucking guy, Eric's man. Cool. He's a... I played Wait. golf with him last week. He's actually a pretty good stick. And I forgot to ask you, is it cool if I leave the pot a little early? Me and him are going to grab some beers and go over our bracket. Oh, that did not go how I planned. He likes college basketball? Oh, yeah, man. His bracket's kicking ass, dude. He picked, like, Oregon to go to the Sweet 16. No one else had that. He's so smart. You should meet him, man. I think you'd really like him. Fuck, that's cool. All right. Well, if you have not listened to us before, or even if you have, you know that we start every episode off with the most important thing in any bro's life, and that is chess day. Our chess day topic today is it's March, and this is our first show reporting the scores of our Pixar vs. the World Movie Madness Tournament. Now, if you're wondering what that is, we will link the bracket in the description below. But just like the NCAA tournament, how it exploits tons of student-athletes every year, we exploit our brain cells, get drunk, and put together a tournament bracket every year with some of our favorite movies. And the theme this year is the greatest Pixar movies on one side, mating, waiting to meet the best eight other animated movies on the other side from the other respective studios. So we're actually going to live score the final matchup of the first round today for Chess Day. But before we do that, Banner, can you tell the people the results so far from their votes on Twitter and how they can get involved and help us with this? Because we are not smart enough to do it all on our own, nor should we. No, we are definitely not smart enough. So again, from the tweeters, uh, we had some great matchups going on. Uh, to be honest with you, we just threw these out there for you guys because we didn't want to have to do them ourselves because there was some doozies out there. Uh, Thank you, by the way, to everyone who voted. You guys fucking kick all of the ass. And don't worry, we have more to come. So, a um, couple of real tight ones. First one, Toy Story 3 versus Finding Nemo. Uh, 31 to 27, Toy Story 3. I don't know how I feel about that one, but really close matchup. I think if that one could have gone a little longer, you know, they just needed they needed one more down. They needed one. Where more. where's my Finding Nemo fans? This right. isn't North Korea. Get out and cast your vote. Maybe uh, they can bitch like the Chiefs do that both teams need the ball in overtime next year. I don't know. 
something like work. that. It might work. Uh, anyway, so that better was, luck next year. That was a real tight matchup, really good. Um, one that was kind of a slaughter, and let's be honest, kind of to be expected. Shrek versus the Prince of Egypt. Shrek took it 56 to 14. Um, I don't think there's Prince any... Prince of Egypt just happy to be here, really. Yeah, they're, they're a Cinderella story. I'm glad that they got some representation. It's, it is a great movie. Um, it, it was actually the 8th scene on the world side, so um, happy that they got some representation. And Madagascar uh, lost 19 to 24 to Despicable Me. Again, not surprised here. Um, I am actually a little shocked that it's that close. I think Madagascar kind of sucks, and Despicable Me is really, really good. Um, but hey, the Madagascar fans got out, and uh, they travel well. Travel well. They do. Kung Fu Panda whooped the fucking shit out of ants, as it should be. Ants doesn't even deserve to be on this fucking bracket. But because You're sick. Jeff you need help. Ra- rated it his number two other movie, it snuck in there. Um, but forty nine sixteen Kung Fu Panda, moving on to the next round. Refs were completely biased. Oh gave it every God. fucking call. All right, whatever. Uh, moving on. Uh, last matchup that wasn't live scored on episode sixty eight. We have Chikorun versus Rise of the Guardians. I don't think I could have been uh, happy or mad either way on this one because uh, I like both those movies. Chicken Run took the cake in that matchup, 21-15. Um, again, Rise of the Guardians, great movie. Really good voice cast. Uh, Very good one. cast. Um, but Chicken Run, just a great story. It's your sleeper, guys. Don't sleep on Chicken Run. Uh, Guys, real quick, go check out the bracket in the description because I would not want to be Shrek facing Chicken Run in the second round. That's all I'll say. Fuck no. So, in the second round, what we've got is Despicable Me versus Kung Fu Panda, Shrek versus Chicken Run, The Incredibles versus Monster Inc. That is going to be a fucking matchup. Uh, And then we have Toy Story 3 versus somebody. We're going to live score this last one here today. Uh, Geiger, can you go over our criteria on live scoring the matches? Sorry, I, I stole your hosting thunder there. Horn that's sec. that's fine. That's fine. That's what I was gonna say anyway. So I'm, I'm grooming you. It's fine. So we grade any movie. If you checked out any of the movie commentaries we've ever done, or if you're new to the pod, we'll go over this really quick on our five ca- criteria: acting, cast, story, best scene, impacts on pop culture, and rewatchability. There's three of us grading. Um, five categories. 15 votes total, first movie to eight wins, basically. And the movie's up tonight. Incredibles 2 versus the original Toy Story. Movie's ready. Get out. This is a heavyweight fight right here. Yeah, the first round, wow. Guys, okay. I'm, before we go into this, I scored it a tie. So I'm just going to throw that well, in. But we've that. talked about how that isn't possible with Fucking math. Fucking Tim Donahue over here is already telling him how he's going to rep it before the game starts. So, Banner, why don't we just go to you with, I guess, voice acting is what we need to call it for Incredibles 2 versus Toy Story. Who should you give the point to? I think I have to go Toy Story. I mean, it's Tim Allen, uh, Tom Hanks, and again, it's kind of like we, we talked about this last episode with Toy Story 2. It's all the role players. Like, yeah, you've got your, your big players, your superstars, but it's the role players. Everybody knows exactly who they are. Um, not that Incredibles 2 doesn't. But I, personally, I, I just think that Toy Story and what they were able to do with that cast um, in that setting in 1994, I believe, when this came out, just absolutely incredible. Um, we're, we got kind of the bookend of the Pixar movies here, the, the most recent versus the very first. So I'm going to have to go Toy Story uh, for acting and cast. Jeff? Yeah, I have to go the same. Uh, the Incredibles cast is incredible. Dare I say? Uh, and I really like the addition of Catherine Keener and Bob Odenkirk as the brother sister tandem that's helping out the Incredibles. But dude, Hanks and Allen, I mean, these are iconic voice acting roles. And this is the first time that we got to hear them. So it was just a game changer. We'll get to all the other things Toy Story did um, in a little bit. But them in those roles, Tim Allen at the time riding the wave of home improvement. Tom Hanks, I mean, fucking owned the 90s. It's it's just they're a buzzsaw. You can't beat them for acting cast, so I have to go Toy Story. Since you kind of stole my thunder, I'm going to go Incredibles 2. Just because Sophia Bush is, I think, the prettiest girl ever. So 
One Geiger, two. she doesn't listen to the pod. I've told you that before. It's one not going to two, help. I will still tweet her. One to two, Toy Story, going on to story. And you got to give this one. I'm going to go ahead and give it to Toy Story because I would say the best original animated story besides Lion King is Toy Story. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, if, like, lions actually talked and stuff, I thought that was really... I don't know, impactful, but this is probably even more original. How toys actually feel when they're not being played with or anything like that. It was an extremely awesome story, very inventive, and it basically, I think, put Pixar on the map. I can't remember if A Bug's Life was before or after this, but this put Pixar on the map. So I'm going with Toy Story. Toy Story up three to one. Going in story, banner. Throw it to you. Uh, yeah, just for the record, if you ask me, uh, Bug's Life came first. Uh, if you ask Pretty much anybody else, Toy Story came first. But or if you asked a poster for A Bug's Life that says from the creators of Toy Story, that one probably say nah, after. That's fine. Uh, yeah, again, this is kind of a no-brainer. This is, It's kind of unfair because you have an original story in Toy Story going up against a sequel in Incredibles 2. But Toy Story, regardless, is just a juggernaut in this cat category. Growing up, you play with toys. And these toys are literally what... You, you're doing when you're playing with them when you're not playing with them as a child you're like oh yeah see toys are real toys are alive as an adult you're like fuck i wish i was still had that imagination it bring as an adult rewatching it it's still a great story and i love it and i mean incredibles 2 was great where they went with the franchise was was fantastic um but it, it doesn't i mean it it, it has nothing on Toy Story, so got to go Toy Story here. Jeff? Yeah, you guys pretty much uh, took the words out of my mouth. I mean, Incredibles 2 somehow made me equally as interested to see this family a second time around, which is tough to do in a sequel. And I actually think uh, it was impressive to pull the film off with pretty much no time jump in the universe. I mean, it, the movie literally starts, I think, what, 10 seconds after the first one ends? <clears throat> which is always tough to do because they the first one felt like a and it is a complete movie but the concept and idea of toy story resonated with me so much as a kid just like banner said to humanize toys and you know even like the character traits of the army men the way they act and andy creating the town with cardboard boxes in the beginning was just so fucking accurate to how i played with toys and that really hit home. And to this day just like you said geiger i think it's one of the most creative stories to tell that I've ever seen in my life. So it's, uh, I mean, has to go to Toy Story here. Five to one, Toy Story. This might be a runaway. However, best scene is next. Yep. Banner. It's, I gotta go Incredibles 2. I know we beat this like a fucking dead horse, but the opening scene doesn't have to be the best scene, but it's gotta set a tone. Incredibles 2, literally, like Jeff said, picks up 12 seconds after the first one ends, when in reality that's f almost 15 years difference and we picked up exactly where it start uh wh where in the incredible stopped picked that story up and that scene right there told us exactly where we were going with this story and although toy story has a ton of iconic scenes a ton of iconic lines i feel like incredibles 2 being what it was needed something like that to start the movie off and it did and it started off with a bang and i was excited let's fucking go incredibles 2 well that's surprising too for people that listen to us because banner loves a good chase scene which i thought he would i do love a good with. chase scene but <laughs> uh jeff best scene for me there's only one scene in this whole tournament that could beat falling with style and that is Jack Jack versus the raccoon. <laughs> if you go listen to our review of Incredibles 2 that I did with Muggsy Bogues, I was crying my eyes out laughing so hard in the theater. I'm just thinking about it now and I'm starting to laugh again. Best scene in this whole fucking tournament. Jack Jack versus the raccoon Incredibles 2 gets my point. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to give him 4 points. 4 to 5. Toy Story is still leading, but Jeff, I got to pick that scene too. I was trying to think the whole time if a Toy Story scene made me laugh out loud. There's some that made me laugh. Don't get me wrong, it's funny. But seeing that in theaters made me laugh out loud. And Jack-Jack, yeah. finally, he... <laughs> the reason I love Incredibles 2 is because the kids are just in it more. 
uh, they have more of a role. And Jack Jack just fucking steals the show, and that was definitely his iconic scene. So, and who who doesn't know someone like the raccoon after it gets it, its ass beat? It still comes back, and because the glass door is in between him and Jack Jack, he's like talking shit again. Yeah. <laughs> I feel right. like I feel like the raccoon is just Bro Force Squad in person. Like that <laughs> raccoon is the Bro Force Squad. That raccoon. Yeah, that that's the Bro Force Squad spirit animal for sure. Five to four, Toy Story, going on to impacts on pop culture. This one will be interesting, Jeff. I mean, I I like The Incredibles too. I think it was cool to get a sequel so long after the original that was really good. But, guys, let's not forget, Toy Story is the reason we're having this tournament all these movies exist. I mean, it changed the game in terms of its type of animation and, like, what it did for legitimizing the genre, just looking at the actors that it got to be the voices in this. I mean, if there's no Toy Story, there's no Pixar vs. the World Movie Madness, so I have to go Toy Story for impact. I'm going to go Incredibles 2. The fuck? And the reason why... Is the same reason I did Incredibles 1. Impacts on pop culture doesn't just have to be, oh, they came out with more movies or anything like that. I've never seen Toy Story shirts around, man. The merchandise Incredibles sells is insane, and it only got bigger with Incredibles 2. The eye on the chest is just as iconic as the bat symbol, just as iconic as the Superman symbol. It's probably more iconic than the – I see more eyes on the chest than I see spiders on the chest. That is and true that's now. Just, yeah. Yeah. That's I'll, just I'll as that. big a deal as impacts on pop culture. I would say that the eye on the chest is third behind the S on the chest and the bat symbol on the chest. That's a huge impact on pop culture for me, man. It doesn't have to be just about movies and Hollywood and careers. Selling merchandise is a big part of these films. And if you think about it, Geiger, to your point, this movie coming out as far after the original as it did, what, like a, a decade? 14 years, it looks like. Yeah. Uh, it literally introduces it to a whole new generation of fans. So it's just doubling down on that pop culture impact because now new kids get to see it for the first time. Not going to lie, I jumped in front of Banner as uh, on purpose because it's 6 to 5 Toy Story. Would he dare? He already kicked out Toy Story 2. Is he going to make this fucking tide? Impacts on pop culture. What's your deal? Okay. Yeah, and also, what's your, also how dare you? Yeah, how dare me? <laughs> yeah, I have a question. <laughs> uh, guys, I, I'm one of those people that when Incredibles came out, as, leaving the theater, I was like, when the fuck are we getting a second one? And I was so upset that Toy Story uh, got announced that they were making four of these before they even announced that they were making a uh, second Incredibles. Fucking Finding Dory came out before we got Incredibles 2. What the fuck is we, that about? We needed that movie, okay? Yeah. No, Ellen DeGeneres just needed more fucking money. Um, yeah. But, again, for somebody that waited the better part of 15 years for Incredibles 2, I have to go Toy Story. It started it all. We wouldn't have the eye on the chest if it wasn't for Toy Story. And, again, I, I can't disagree. I can't combat what you said about, hey, you the, you see more eyes on the chest than you do spiders or Batmans or anything like that. But if it wasn't for Toy Story, we wouldn't even have that eye on the chest. So I have to I have to go Toy Story here. 7-5 Toy Story going into our last one. Rewatchability. Jeff? Going to have to go with Incredibles 2 here. Um, wow. I think I like Toy Story more as a, as a movie. But in terms of things that I want to go back and see again, Screen Slaver, really fun villain. And I actually like the twist with Screen Slaver. Won't spoil it here. Really cool action set piece on the train with Elastigirl. All the new superheroes introduced are great. I think that was a cool element. And Toy Story is ironic, don't get me wrong. But if I want to throw something on spur of the moment... It's going to be Incredibles 2. Now, if you would have said soundtrack, this would be an ass-whooping of epic proportions. You got a brand new re. Randy but, Newman. Randy Newman. But I'd rather just throw that on and, and it brings back You weren't quite nasally enough. I'm sorry. I, I don't have a, as bad a cold as Geiger does fighting the allergies. <laughs> I guess yes. a bad allergies. Maybe I can sing for you later. Probably sound just <laughs> like them. And I love Toy Story, but if it's just like, hey, which, what do you want to throw on real quick? Incredibles is so fun. The animation's so awesome. Um... And maybe it's just because it's recency bias, but I just think rewatchability, I'd rather watch Incredibles 2. Seven to six, Toy Story. I could be a dick here, but I'm just going to throw it to Banner. I am actually going to be a dick back because I'm going to go Incredibles 2 here. 
Um, wow. Again, guys, I love Toy Story. I will pop it in, you know, all the fucking time. I, I, I mean, maybe once every six months. But since Incredibles 2 has come out, which, what, we're at almost the year mark of it coming out in theaters. I've probably watched it four times. It's incredible. I, and I, pun intended, but it's very fun. It's, it's just a good movie. Again, you have all the superheroes. We get, like you guys said, we get the kids more. Um, Jack Jack steals the fucking show. Uh, he does. I know it's not the year of the woman anymore like it was, but I really liked what they did with Elastigirl and gave her the limelight, whereas Mr. Incredible kind of had the, the spotlight in the first one. Uh, Right now, at this point in my life, Incredibles 2, I would rather watch than Toy Story. Okay, I think... So it's tied up right now, it's right? Seven, it's 7-7, seven, seven, and I'm the deciding vote. This is the problem here. Incredibles 1... Incredibles 2 is way better than Incredibles 1. And Incredibles 1 is a fantastic you movie. check yourself, but okay. When I saw way Incredibles better? 2 in theaters, everything I wanted to happen, happened. They showed the kids more. I thought the villain had more layers to it. I liked the story better. However, what you guys are not thinking about is you're thinking about rewatchability right now. When Toy Story first came out, I watched the shit out of that. Now, if you That's would ask true. me to watch Toy Story right now, I'd be like, dude, I've watched it so many times. Now, would I want to watch it? Of course. But if you ask me right now what I'd rather watch, it would be Incredibles 2. However, this is rewatchability. How many times have I watched? I would, when my life is dead and gone, I will watch Toy Story way more than I watch Incredibles 2. That's why I'm giving it to Toy Story, the original, for a couple reasons. One, because it's just a better movie, and two, because our fans will fucking riot if we throw out the first Toy Story that created it all. It's yeah, in the first movie. round. Yeah. It can't if, the only, if the only Toy Story movie that made it to the second round when all three are in the tournament is Toy Story 3, we did something wrong. I know. Well, and there, I, I saved me and my wife a lot of death threats, too, through mail, so... Eight to seven, Toy Story moving on. Jeff, back to you. Wow. Wow. All right. Well, I mean, it's sad that one team had to lose, but that's that's sports. And yeah, I think just feel bad for the kids, Ernie. They busted it. You know, all year they've been working hard. Feel bad for the seniors. Um, But Incredibles two. Incredibles two. Don't hang your freshman that'll only be here for two months and then graduate and go to the NBA and make millions. Just bad. So now we avoid that final four potential matchup that would have been the Incredibles and Toy Story. But now Toy Story has to face Toy Story 3 in the second round. So little, uh, it's like two coaches from the same coaching tree fighting each other. Or the Civil War, brother on brother. It's disgusting, but tears families apart. We love it. It's like Latinos going after each other. (laughs) Except with way less hookers. Yeah. (laughs) Or maybe maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, I don't know how Toy Story 3 rolls. <clears throat> All right, that ends our chess day topic for today, and that moves us on to the second part of our show, which is our protein shake, where we go around and see what is in everyone's protein shake, also known as what have we watched lately. Banner, I will go to you. I know a few of the things you've watched, and I will probably want to talk about them again with you. So what's in your cup, also known as what have you watched lately? All right, so as you guys know from last episode, we're, we're coming down the home stretch for Endgame. Um, as is tradition, anytime a, a new big MCU movie comes out, I have to watch it beginning to end, front to back, um, starting with Iron Man. So uh, last week I made it all the way through the first Thor. This week I watched Captain America First Avenger because I have to. It's part of the rules. Uh, Marvel's The Avengers. It's just a great movie. Iron Man 3. Man, it's still a fun movie. I know, Jeff, you have your qualms about it, but it's still a fun movie. Thor The Dark World. Still sucks dick, but thinking back about it, it wasn't as bad when I first watched it, but going back watching it, yeah, (laughs) it's fucking bad. Uh, Watch Winter Soldier. I still think that's the best MCU movie to date. And then I also watch Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, I have one God, more. hard to believe Marvel put those out back to back. Like, that's what I'm fucking talking about. Yeah. Uh, I have one more movie, but I, Jeff, I'm pretty sure you watched it as well, so I'll save it for then. Um, Perfect. Basically, I watched back half of Phase 1 and front half of Phase 2 of the MCU. Um, Jeff, I know you have words that you so want to talk you, about. So what do you – next you have Ant-Man or Ultron and then I, Ant-Man, Ultron right? and Ant-Man. Uh, Ultron's probably going to happen tonight and then obviously Ant-Man and then moving into Civil War and, and uh, Phase 3 moving on to next week. 
So I'm I think s- Ultron on, and I know you haven't watched this yet, so we can talk about a next protein shake. But that one actually gets better the more I go see it. I, maybe I'm just more forgiving of its mistakes because it has some fucking awesome scenes. It has some really cool mashup scenes, which um, I wanted. I think that that opening scene might be one of the best. Like if we did an MCU tournament, that might be one of the best scenes. I think the only one that could beat it is the first Avengers. Um, when they assemble on the bridge, but that opening scene when they jump over the fucking thing is pretty fucking cool. So aside from the Mandarin, which we don't acknowledge, is Malekith the worst MCU villain? No, Malekith is the worst. Even though you don't like that twist, and I know a lot of people don't, that movie was super fun, and the Mandarin twist was... Okay, it is what it is. It was fucking stupid, but whatever. It is what it is. Malekith is fucking dog shit. And he is, I would say, 80% of the reason, while that movie is the worst MCU movie, Natalie Portman is the other 20%. Yeah, she did not want to be there. Patty Jenkins was originally hired to direct, who actually ended up doing Wonder Woman, and then she left the project, and Natalie was like basically held at gunpoint in her yeah. contract, which is funny to picture. It was It was bad. Uh, but Winter Soldier, guys, it's the best movie in the MCU. I think it's better than the Avengers. What the Avengers did was... Last week you said Iron Man was. Uh, yeah, I know, but now I've watched Winter Soldier. <laughs> Winter Soldier is really fun. Winter, good. Dude, it's, it's probably, I know, it is. If it you is guys haven't realistic. visited it recently... But then after you watched the first Guardians, I'd probably say that one is, too. There's a lot of great movies. I watched... Dude, it's so hard, because I literally, in three days, I watched Thor The Dark World, Captain America Winter Soldier... And Guardians of the Galaxy, and I think Winter Soldier is better than Guardians of the Galaxy, but fuck Guardians of the Galaxy They're just is so really different. Good. They are. They're very different movies. Which is why it's funny when Winter Soldier meets Rocket in Infinity War. All right, I'm I'm jealous, Banner. That sounds really fun. Geiger, how about you? What's in your protein shake? What have you seen lately? So I've seen a lot of stuff, but I'm just going to keep it to one because I'm trying to stay hip. I'm trying to be the hip guy on the pod and stay with the kids. That's so fucking Even though this is a classic rock band. I watched The Dirt on Netflix, The Motley Crue. Not really a documentary. It's over their book that was a bestseller about, I think, nine years ago, ten years ago. It's getting mixed reviews. As a Motley Crue fan, I thought it was fucking fantastically done. I, I get that you can nitpick... See, this is the the problem I have with movies in case people come at me because I know I bash Bohemian Rhapsody. It's not if you leave some stuff out or if some st- – I understand you only have an hour and a half to tell a story that happened in 12 years. So some stuff might be a little minuscule. However, all four members of this band, Nikki Six, Mick Mars, uh, Vince Neil, and Tommy Lee, are all executive produced. They all wrote the book, so they all show the good, the bad, and the ugly of each person, which I like. It, you know, one band member is not there or is dead, and they basically bash him the whole time. It's very fucking t- TVMA. A lot of sex, a lot of tits, a lot of drug use. It is a fantastic – it's the best rock movie I've ever seen. It's better than the Doors movie, which I actually really like. There's some Elvis movies that I like that they did on his life. Um, but this, I think, is going to set the point – rock movies in the future especially for this type of band like if they ever did i would say a beatles one or rolling stones one where they'd have some drugs and some debauchery but very well acted too uh jeff i know you touched on off pod i can't remember the actor's name but the guy from the punisher season who's the guy that's uh goes back to the war and goes nuts it's Ben neal i think he was the strongest person in this show machine gun kelly played tommy lee did not think the whole time as machine gun kelly he did a fantastic job uh, the guy from Game of Thrones that cuts off Reek's penis played Mick Mars. He did a fantastic Spoilers. job. Spoilers. Wow. Mickey Six, whoever played him, was so great. Some of the best scenes, they showed Nikki Six overdose. I know he overdosed a bunch of times, but the time where he actually overdosed and died for like 10 minutes, like legally died, and they brought him back. Uh, That's a party lock- there. Yeah, I know. That is a fucking party. That He needs to come to a Bro4 squad party. I don't know if he can make it. <laughs> I don't know if he can survive. Uh, the Heather Locklear marriage between Tommy Lee. The only problems I had with it, which I guess are kind of good problems, is I wanted more. I think this should have been a series. There's nothing about Pamela Anderson in it. Um, there, really? Die, nothing. It wow. was all about Heather Locklear. They kind of stopped it around 91. However, at the very end scene. Do they call her Heather Locklear by name? Yeah. Interesting. 
Ozzy Osbourne's in it. There's some great scenes with him. Uh, David Lee Ross in it. He was just in it for a split scene, but I wanted them to uh, dig into the tour whenever White Snake canceled on him because they had a big solo at the time and they didn't want to play second fiddle to Motley Crue, so they toured with Guns N' Roses. I wanted that. We don't get that. We don't get Pamela Anderson. There's a bunch of stuff that you don't get, but you get enough, dude. This is a must watch. If you're a rock fan or a music fan or just fans of drugs and sex, you need to watch this. It's fantastic. Also, subscribe to the Bro Force Squad. Yeah. If you're a fan of if sex you're a fan and of drugs. drugs, sex and rock. Yeah, we don't have any musical talent, but I mean, we like all the other stuff. That's cool. Well, that's good. I know when I saw the director was the guy that did Jackass, I was like, this could go one of two ways. I feel like he'll get the debauchery angle, but can he tell a cohesive story with music involved? And it's a relief to hear that he. It's insane. That it's part. a very fun movie, but then there's some spots like. Uh, if you know a lot about the van, like Vince Neil, like kills, basically kills a guy in his car, like gets in a car wreck and kills him is on hook for manslaughter, could go to jail for a really long time. And they think that's going to break up the band. And then he loses his daughter. There's a bunch of really stuff that, I mean, my wife started crying during some of it. It has everything a movie should have it. It's, it's a fantastic, it's the best music movie I've ever seen because it tells the highs, it tells the lows. It doesn't just point out one person and say that they're the problem of the band the whole time. It is fantastically done, I think. Was it, could it have been better acted? Yeah, if it's a big studio film, of course. But it's a Netflix film, man. They could just afford Machine Gun Kelly and shit. What do you want them to do? I think they did a fantastic job. <laughs> Machine Gun Kelly's second solid, uh, net, second straight Netflix outing in the past couple See, months. See, man, though. he's not a bad actor. I dig him. I always liked his music, but... Eminem would disagree. He's a bad actor. Well, Bad I don't actor, care actor. because as a huge, huge Slim Shady fan, I would have to say Machine Guns rap disc was fucking head and toes better than fucking Eminem's kill shot bullshit. That's terrible. You need to get back on drugs or something. That was god awful bad. <laughs> Eminem, unlike Sophia Bush, does listen to the pod. So we're going to hear. Rap Devil that. is a fucking great song. I have it on Spotify. It's great. Well, you've drawn your line in the sand. You've chosen. Is that all you want to talk about today? Yeah, man. That's. I, I wanted to basically talk about that movie because I liked it so much. So. I wish I had seen it so we could talk about it together. But with your endorsement, I will definitely be checking it out soon. Maybe tonight. Who knows? When I put the kids to bed that I don't have. <laughs> all right. Three things that I watched. Rachel's night? Not, uh, yeah. Rachel, Rachel has the kids. Her and Eric, who's apparently fucking awesome. He's a sucks. fucking cool guy. Kids I'm golfing with him Saturday, Banner. You want to? Come, me and Thurman. Uh, yeah. I'm right here. Yeah. I'm right here. Uh, are you going to the barbecue at his house where he's, he's cooking ribs on yeah, Sunday? Dude. I'm wondering which dish to bring. Well, at least he doesn't have a smoker, right? I call potato salad. Damn, okay. All right, to my protein shake, because fuck Eric. Three things that I watched. Guys, my lists are getting, I would say they used to be eclectic. Like, I would have all different types of genres. But now I'm starting to have a problem. I watched another uh, chick flick rom-com, actually not a rom-com, just a debaucher movie, Rough Night. Have you guys heard of this movie? No. It came out in 2017. It's basically a female version of The Hangover. It stars Scarlett Johansson, Jillian Bell, uh, Kate McKinnon, Demi Moore, Ty Burrell. Guys, it was really fucking good. Zoe Kravitz is in it. Um, It's Scarlett Johansson in a role we don't get to see her in very much. It's basically like she's this uptight um, – well, not uptight, but she's like a running for city council, and she goes on her bachelorette party, and her and her friends do a bunch of drugs, and shit gets out of control. Something happens in the beginning of the second act of the movie that I won't spoil, but uh, it was hilarious. And there's kind of a cool like mystery element to it that comes into play, but I highly recommend it. I gave it four to five stars on Letterboxd. My girlfriend loved it. And there's a lot of hot chicks in it doing funny stuff. Scarlett Johansson is as funny as I've ever seen her. Does ScarJo have really short hair in this one? She does, short blonde hair. Okay, I remember. I remember this trailer actually. And Ty Burrell and Demi Moore play the neighbors at this beach house where they're staying, and they're like sex addicts. <laughs> so that comes into play a lot. Like Ty Burrell as a sex addict with Demi Moore as his wife, and Demi Moore like really wants to fuck Zoe Kravitz. <laughs> <laughs> who like used to be a lesbian, but now she's like straight and basically right. has like I tried mean, to. You, you try right, to yeah, get rough yeah. night. Okay, rough, night, yeah, rough yeah. night. It's funny and we'll it's talk a hard. We'll talk about it next hard. week. 
Also, this is funny. The guy who plays Mayhem in the Allstate commercials, he's in it. <laughs> and I was like, who the fuck is that? We had to pause it's it. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, dude, he's actually not that bad of an actor. Uh, and then at the same time, Scarlett Johansson's soon to be husband is on his bachelor party and him and his friends are like super effeminate. They're at like a wine tasting and they're all like <laughs> probably closet gay. And it's just really funny to see the dichotomy of their two because <laughs> it's, it plays counter to every stereotype we're used to, which is certainly there are real couples like this, but the girls are the ones having the crazy fucking night. And the guys are the ones like drinking wine and sniffing each other's buttholes basically <laughs> as it cuts back and forth. So rough night, very much recommend that. Uh, a movie that I really can't recommend in good earnest, and what the hell's wrong with me? I watched Pitch Perfect three. They're fun. Yesterday. It's a fun movie. Have you seen the third one though? Yeah. Look, any of them. At the end of the day, you can play karaoke to all three of them. Yeah, I guess. But they're my fun issue, movies. My issue with the third one is the third one really felt like it was laughing at me for watching it. It was like, overplayed ha, for sure. We got you to fucking watch this. John Lithgow's in it, and he has a purposely bad Australian accent, which is horrible. DJ Khaled is in it, which alone, like, if I would have known that, I honestly would not have watched it. Not kidding. And it's just not enough of the fun covers that I wanted. Um, I don't know. I just, for the first time in the, the three of the Pitch Perfect movies, I felt like, ah, damn it, they tricked me. Like, it's they definitely got me. the weakest. I'll, I'll give you that. Not even close. And they set it up to where, like, they're begging no one to ask them to make a fourth one. It's like how the movie ends. This is a straight to DVD when they don't even fucking make DVDs. This should have gone straight to DVD, but it's still fun. And the characters were never that grounded in reality. But in this one, I almost feel like we're we're so far off the deep end. It's like, who even what even are these fucking individuals? I don't know. It, it didn't rock a Pella. That's what I'll say. Check out our letterbox review on that one, too. I was not too kind. Uh, and then the last one, Banner, you and I, a little mini, mini review right here. We watched the sequel to Emperor's New Groove, Kronk's New Groove, starring our favorite member of the series, Kronk. Banner, how do you think it held up? What were your thoughts? Honestly, guys, for it was great. I loved it. I thought it was really? awesome. Until yeah. the last about eight minutes, yeah, I really enjoyed I'll give you that, but still, I mean, it's an, when it's an hour and 15 minutes, and you're an hour and what five minutes in and the last eight minutes are disappointing you're like you know what it wasn't that bad it wasn't a waste of my time i enjoyed it check out coming out soon because i'm getting drunk enough i'm gonna convince these fuckers to do a commentary as soon as we get off of here oh, no group. <laughs> think things i liked i liked how a point of the story was Kronk um taking a group of kids to the uh, chipmunk challenge it was so great in the forest. I like that David Spade and John Goodman both came back. I like that Yzma came back in a smaller role. I like that Kronk was working at the restaurant <laughs> as the head chef. Everything um, that we loved about Emperor's New Groove, like Kronk specifically in Emperor's New Groove, we got more of in Kronk's New Groove. But when Kronk's dad does show up at the end, it, it goes off the rails for the I'll last five to ten that. minutes. I'll agree with that. And that's when I was like, even though it was an hour 15, I was like, all right, we can fucking wrap this thing up. It's on Netflix right now. It's definitely not going to be the worst thing you watch this month. I'll say that. Crunch <laughs> I, I liked it's, it. I think you guys should watch it. I think we're going to do a commentary when we get off of here. I'll say this. If the tagline to the movie wasn't squeaker, squeak, squeaking, the marketing department really fucked up. Like that should have been on Everything. everywhere you saw the. Kronk's new groove, squeaker, squeak, squeaker. I kind of want to get that tattooed across my chest. It's just so offensive, you know? You know what I mean? Nah, also, same. Nate, if Nate Thurman's listening, well, I don't even want to get into that, but no, we had an issue. It. We went to a Disney themed bar trivia night a couple weekends ago, and there was a question about Kronk and what language he speaks, like what animal language he speaks in the movie. I said chipmunk it's because squirrel. he's. A, it's squirrel, but like, why is it camp chip chip a monk? Why is it the chip a monk championship? That's Kronk's new groove, not Emperor's new groove. There's a difference. No, it's the same. It's the exact same animal. Nah, no, nah, chipmunks and squirrels are different animals. Same family, different genus. I don't even think you believe that. I I made it up. I was quick on my feet. You got to believe me. All right, and that brings us to our final part of the show. But before we get yeah, there, yeah, brah. 
Henry, you have your hand raised. You have a question. Yeah, yeah, brah. I'm just, just wondering, brah. You even live, brah? Excuse me? Brah. Like, like pump to iron, like live. You ain't live, brah? What kind of accent is that? You ain't live, brah? Why does oh. every accent I do sound Jamaican? If it doesn't start there, it's where we end up, inevitably. Yo, bro, way, do, we our, even, do we even lift, man? Check out our Cool Runnings movie commentary, by the way. Shameless plug. And that brings us to our question and answer segment. Do you even lift, do you even lift bra? Where we dig up some questions, or in this case, question, from the internet and talk about it on our show. And our lone question today comes to us from Wisconsin underscore life. And his handle is at Badger Cheese 84 <laughs> Another great Might Twitter handle. Might be one handle. of the best Twitter handles we've had. Especially because Wisconsin Life, Badger Cheese, I mean, it all just makes sense. And he or she asks, what moment in a movie always gets you choked up? Mine are Apollo 13, when you hear Tom Hanks say, hello, Houston, this is Odyssey. It's good to see you again, which is a great movie, but my theater actually clapped when we realized they made it. <laughs> and the other one is uh, his is Saving Private Ryan when, spoiler alert for Saving Private Ryan, skip ahead 15 seconds if you haven't seen it, when Captain Miller dies. I mean, it shows you how iconic Tom Hanks is that both these scenes are fucking on here. Great ones, Wisconsin underscore life. Geiger, how about you? Any movie moments you're willing to admit have got you choked up? Well, first I was thinking any Miles Teller movie because I just cried just thinking how the fuck you? does he still get gigs in Hollywood? <laughs> but or that you spent gonna, like forty dollars on tickets and popcorn to go see it. I I'm gonna pick a movie that it it almost makes me cry every fucking time I see it, and that's near the end of Blow with uh, Johnny Depp and Ray yeah. Liotta. Just the father and son. First off the acting that these two fucking do because they're about the same age and they're father and son and just imagine just having one last drink with your dad and then when he asks is this the last time I'm going to see you and he's like I hope not pop but fuck you know I'm running from the law I'm going to Mexico and whenever he says something like I'm really good at what I do and he said George let me tell you something you'd be good at anything because that's what any dad thinks of his son and just their dynamic there that they're having fun, and he gives the speech, let the wind always be at your back, sun upon your face. And It's basically the last time he's going to see him. Always gets me choked up because it always makes me think, like, I mean, we all have, you know, dads on this pod. Like, if we were having a drink with him, what it would be the last thing that we'd talk about? We'd probably laugh some, and it would probably be kind of depressing, too. But I would have to say with the score in that and the acting. And that that's quote, scene, man. Just, and the quote. I mean, that's one of my favorite quotes, too. It just fucking... I mean, just go to someone else, Jeff. I'm about to... Some in your eye. Tear. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. Vanner, how about you? These uh, damn allergies. <laughs> fucking allergies. Uh, Can't I've, shake them. Fuck. I've got one and a half here. So the first one, I've said this in past pods. I think I said it last week because we talked about this scene in Toy Story 2. Uh, when Jessie is singing about how her human gro grew up and doesn't didn't play with her anymore, that whole song, every time it gets me because it makes me think about how, like... As a kid, you are just so kind of oblivious to the world. And then as you grow up, you kind of become jaded and you don't have the same imagination that you used to. And that song and that whole scene kind of makes you think like, man, being a kid was the good old days. What happened? Now I've got bills and all this shit that I have to deal with. Every time it makes me choked up how they relay that, that message through that song um, always makes me choked up. And then uh, – Horns, Geiger, you guys both know I'm a softie for weddings. I love weddings. They're one of the most fun, happiest times ever. Uh, anytime I see a wedding episode in any kind of show, I know the movie was – or the, the question was specifically about movies, but I'm going to go to a TV show here. One of the best wedding episodes is The Office. I cry – this is for joy, but I cry every time. I think that's a great uh, episode how they – kind of do the two different times where, hey, they're having the ceremony and everything where everybody's dancing and it's with the whole office, but then they also actually get married on the boat at Niagara Falls or soaking wet. That episode he cuts right his there. Tie. That's he, great. Yeah, like that whole – everything about that episode just makes me feel good and makes me filled with happiness and joy. Makes me re remember my wedding day, which was uh, second best day in my life uh, right behind when my daughter was born. So – that episode. Oh, sorry. Yeah, ah, that's 
that's like that's like one and a half. X Men Two. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that episode, it just it makes me tear up every time. Uh, so that's mine. Toy Story Two and the wedding ep- episode of The Office. That's a great one. You saying Toy Story Two actually gave me another honorable mention for me. Uh, to flash it back to our Pixar vs. the World movie madness, opening credits of Up. Fuck. That's so I mean, sad. Ha- I can't watch the movie because there's too many goddamn tears in my eyes after that. Um, all right, so mine are both animal-related, no doubt. I love dogs. Uh, my my old beagle that I used to have was my best friend, greatest Sam. dog in the history of Earth, Rip Sam. So I'm going to go the end scene of Homeward Bound, when, again, yeah. spoilers for yeah. Homeward Bound. But when you don't know if Shadow is going to make it, and then he comes, I'm actually about to start crying again, fuck. And then he comes out, <laughs> I'm serious, he comes out of the canyon and he's limping and you're just like, oh my god. Because Chance and Sassy are like, they're there and that's great, but Shadow was the old dog. Who he's the heart the and soul. Time. Right, and you just don't know if he has enough strength to get out of that canyon. And he does, and he's limping and you're just like, Jesus Christ. Ah, that's why we go to the fucking movies. And then, of course, We're another like six one. six years old, the front row, like, come on, Shadow! Come God on! God damn it! You Shadow plays do it. Shoot, shoot Shadow up with some cortisone, and he's good. Uh, and then also spoilers for Marley and me. But I actually think it was the hardest I've ever cried to any movie in my life. Doesn't mean it was the most emotion, but for some reason I could not stop the fucking tears. And it's the speech Owen Wilson says to Marley while Marley is laying on the operating table. Um, about to be put to sleep. It's a speech that everyone has felt about a dog at some point in their life. Banner, I know you recently had to go through this. Obviously, yeah. I went through this. It's a very emotional time, and everything he says is so true about the impact that a dog has on you and your family's life, and it's just... God, I hate to end on this for this show, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. It was just so true, and it's the impact that an animal can have on your life. It's really profound and kind of hard to quantify, but I think he does a good... I kind of want to read the book to see if they took that speech verbatim because it's just so eloquent and well put and owen wilson a guy that has had some ridiculous movie moments in that scene he reached back and threw his fastball and probably clocked triple digits or more than he ever has in any uh emotional scene before logo marley and me and homeward bound and i'm not crying you're crying no one picked lion king (sighs) i mean that's another great yeah it's it's I, that's one that I will say I don't cry every time. I definitely cried at one point in my life, but I've come to terms. I've come to grips with Lion King. That's not one that that's a tearjerker every time. Like it doesn't. I would say all of the ones that we just said pulls on an emotional string every time I see it. Doesn't matter what point in my life I've been in. Yeah, I think for me, the only difference between that and Homeward Bound, because I was about the same age when I saw him, was the scene in Lion King happens so much earlier in the movie that I didn't really realize the stakes of it. You like pretty how... much get Akuna Makata right after that. Yeah. But that is a great one. I mean, that should be on everyone's, if we had to do a top Check ten list. Of... commentary. Is it on the... uh, no, it's no, scheduled. It's, it's coming out soon. Scheduled. Keep an eye out. It's scheduled, that. guys. Calm down. Chill. Fuck with the hate mail. Oh, this one's not even about Lion King. Jeff, kill yourself. All right. All right, guys, before I before I let you go to uh, Eric and my ex-wife Rachel's barbecue, anything you want to leave the people with on episode 69 of the Bro4 Squad podcast? Bain, are you first? Geiger, are you bringing pasta salad or potato salad? Because I'll bring the other. Uh, I was thinking about just doing a pie, maybe some desserts. Ooh, I don't do cherry, so anything other than the cherry, I'm good with that. He's going to have desserts, too? You see, for the kids listening, 69 means when you lay at one end yep. and the girl <laughs> lays at the other. All right. And you guys talk about religion. Geiger, anything you want to close with not related to premarital sex? No. It's like, well, if you're going to handcuff me, then no. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ, tie both arms behind me. No, no, it's cool, Tipper Gore. Keep going, whatever you want. <laughs> All right, on that note, for the mad scientist Brian Banner and our enforcer in the paint, Matt Geiger, I'm the mayor, Jeff Hornacek, and we have been the Bro 4 Squad. Thank you for checking us out for 69 episodes strong because that's a sex thing. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Bro 4 Squad. We will be tweeting all of the matchups for the Pixar vs. the World movie madness. Please vote. Please comment. Actually, next uh, next week, let's read some of the comments on the show, everybody who commented, because we got some good ones. Comment on us. Let us know what your favorite animated movie is. Check out all of our reviews on letterboxd.com. Search for us, Bro4Squad, three words. 
Subscribe to us on iTunes, Spotify, and YouTube. Bro, Force, Squad. Three words, type that in and check out everything that we post in our squad blog on our website, broforsquad.com. Till next time, we will catch you at the Chipmunk Chipmunk Championships. Squeaker, squeak, squeak, squeaking. squeaking. So squeak. the oval on the six and the nine, is that the person's mouths or their private parts? Always? That's the debate. Right? I've actually, and, and... I don't know the answer to that.